use. Um, however, if you are not, um, you need to look at your community um, and how unique it is. Um, I don't think, uh, and, and the type of game that you're playing, obviously, and, and the expected behavior that you're asking of your players, and the cognitive impact, all those things are really important in terms of, A, preparing your players um, to play that game, um, and B, um, allowing them to manage, uh, giving them the tools to manage themselves and one another during play. Um, those things are successful. Um, no specific tools necessarily are, um, but you know they can. Um, I know that's not that's not like a very specific answer, um, but I think it, it's so nuanced. Work is so nuanced that um, you kind of have to be a designer about it. It's speaking as someone who's a designer and a community manager, and the first point of safety contact for a lot of people, and fills a lot of roles. We're teaching our very own community just the baby steps of how to have those conversations. How do you even articulate, I had a bad feeling about something, maybe it's a safety feeling, maybe it's an emotional safety feeling, maybe it's a physical one, who do I talk to about that? Is it gonna be okay to talk to them about that? What's the expected outcome? We're teaching our community as a whole how we want those to be handled by having, our, having those conversations with our staff that are out there seeing folks and interacting with them and maybe sometimes putting them in situations where they're gonna have feelings about stuff and giving our staff the tools to proactively have those conversations so that the rest of the player base knows they can come and have the second part of that conversation, which is proactively reaching them. Uh, it's, it's going well, I think we're still in the baby phases of that, but we've seen a lot of response from our community of, oh, I don't have to suck it up and take it in play and be my character, like it's okay to go have a conversation about something that they're worried about, so that our staff can then catch and say, that is a completely valid concern, let's go have a conversation about it, and then we can address it as part of your play experience. I want to add something uh, to a very important thing that Brody said, which was um, talking about having a third point of contact who's not part of the organizational structure. Um, and we've been doing that in a couple different environments with people who are not part of the organizational structure and are not part of the, um, or not explicitly a part of the uh, uh, ruling group. Like um, in an organization, I mean, we recently switched from having a grievance committee to a community response team, people now talk to them more. Because it's not every time you get a weird feeling and say, can we talk for a minute? Is that a grievance and it's a big step. It can be, oh, I feel much better, thanks. And then go back to play. And so having somebody who is separate from all your other structures and is just there as a point of contact, um, and especially a person uh, without those other duties who then has time. So they need to sit with somebody for half an hour right in the middle of a thing. They can do that. Um, that's been super helpful. Yeah. And I just want to add um, one thing for me. I was I first learned about ten years ago, and then about eight years ago I took an extended break. <laughs> and I first came back in and I helped run a LARP a few months back. And I just want to say I think a great thing that's happened is just that we're having these conversations now and the world is so different than it used to be when I was in it before. Just none of this stuff. We had to create safe rooms, we had to have safety committees to remove people who were unsafe. Whereas I remember there being kind of creepy people who were allowed to be at the LARP so I was at before who would just watch and not play and maybe some groups are okay with that. But it really made a lot of people uncomfortable and just I think it's easy to get caught on what we're not doing right or what the community's not doing right. We should acknowledge just how far it's come even in the last 10 years. Thanks for that positive note. Um, <laughs> I, I did that. Um, uh, something Alex touched on was addressing this at the design level. So not just making a LARP and then sticking some safety mm -hmm. on top. Um, for those of you, well, for all of you actually, how do you think that you can start thinking about the safety of your players at the level of design. Um, I think uh, for just uh, trying not to get too in them. You said you didn't want this to just theory, right? So okay. So I know you can't resist a little theory. Oh, yeah. uh, well, <laughs> no. I was, well, I was going to move into the realm of anecdote. Um, <laughs> and uh, so not to uh, not to shamelessly self plug. Um, but Brody and I are a game, and um, it's uh, going to be played tonight, actually. But it began to hide that from that. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, I think 
it's designed in such a way. Um, well, I, well I'm, sure. I'm talking too much. You go ahead. So um, the design challenge of that is that um, we wanted to make a game uh, in which uh, in which people would have exploratory touch with each other, platonic exploratory touch, um, which uh, if you if you were to uh, go off of safety culture by reading what's online, that would sound like the most dangerous thing that you could have. In the dark. In the dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we set out to do that. Um, and uh, we knew that in doing that, the people have safe exploratory touch like that. It's just how do they get to that spot, and then if that becomes something they don't want, how do they revoke their participation in that? So, um, to make that a safe game, um, one, we focused on workshopping. Most of the participation is workshopping. Much longer than the game. <laughs> um, and uh, iteratively building on a group identity and being able to calibrate within the group and progressively uh, not only test what's happening, uh, so you, someone can or test the mechanics of the game so they can understand, people can understand how to play, but also um, gradually go deeper and uh, be able to pull out due to gradually uh, introducing more and more touch mechanics so that people can, if they're not warming up with the group, take themselves out. And the second part of that is also designing concept mechanics that are, uh, as, as Alex had said, like, uh, relative to the game that we designed. If we can't have a game in the dark where everyone's touching each other uh, and not talking, in which you use the OK check-in system, no one can see the OK check-in. You can go out of characters. There really, it's it's there aren't really characters. There is embodiment, not so many, so not so much like a, a formal uh, formal character. So one of the ways that you uh, the way that you uh, enforce your agency and protect yourself is by walking out of the room, and we make that uh, clear and safe. We make that one of the sole ways of expressing that so that there aren't a bunch of confusing safety mechanics. A safety mechanic that is not enforced uh, is worse than not having one. So um, thinking about the design of the game and uh, yeah, how people can enforce their agency, what type of risk is being taken in that, and then how people can uh, control not only their interactions between other people, but also uh, enforce their agency to remove themselves from the situation. Um, I think the workshopping is really is really the key. Um, it, you know, those are great points. Uh, I just want to under undersell I think how successful the workshopping is for this game, where it's like we identify like verbally the behavior like, behavior up front that you're going to be doing, um, and then we keep underscoring that as you go, and like gradually let you explore um, it individually and socially, um, which um, allows you to calibrate your own level of comfort. Um, as you go, um, and these are like very conscious design choices that we're making because this game um, other, just could not operate op operate otherwise. Um, and I think there, the design choices are such that they will not work in other games. You know, they just like, couldn't work in other games. They're specific to this, and they work well because it's this game. And final point: we also take some time, not just debriefing, but also de-rolling and getting um, essentially a bunch of people who are content with touching each other back to operating in a world outside of that space so that they don't come out very handsy. Um, that's, a respons <laughs> that's a responsibility that a designer has to their players in, in, in taking this transformative uh, alibi through game, um, allowing that to happen, and then also shepherding it back to uh, like the normal circumstances of the world. I like, the, I like the idea that, that um, what consent looks like transforms throughout the pro this process here. All of a sudden, you're you're having a very different, um, very nuanced. It's, it's I guess not nuanced, but it's a, it's a tra transformed version of what consent normally looks like. And then we need to sort of like flip that switch back. Remember what consent outside this room looks like. So I'm going to comment from the other side of not having the luxury of designing a fresh environment in a game, um, and not. Also not just trying to bolt on safety mechanics after the fact. In the process of teaching our community how to have new levels of conversation about consent and safety, we're building a platform to then be able to go back and say, since we have committed to this as a community, and you guys can see there are limits to what we can do based on this, now we have the ability to make some changes to the existing game design to support that. Uh, that's a really scary step. I don't think we're there for a lot of those things yet. 
but as people are starting to become more comfortable having conversations about, you know, I, I'm worried about being able to get a safe night's sleep because of the way that this game is designed with, with combat being able to happen, then we can say, hey everybody, every, everybody who's expressed this is important, let's make a design change in what safe spaces physically in our game look like and where those types of combat are available and where they're not. Um, we're making some design changes to promote folks who don't feel physically safe having different types of combat to be able to interact with the game in ways that don't involve that at all. Uh, we're getting the involvement of some of our sister chapters who are seeing what we're doing and are very interested in it and sharing those things back and forth so you have a larger community of support at the game leadership level to say, look, this is a thing we're all doing together. Uh, it's really complicated, but instead of just saying, well, we're going to start the whole game over, 21 years, done, great. It's building the requirements and then being able to, to back channel the actual design of some of the mechanics. Does anyone else have thoughts on that? Oh, that's fun. Um, so this is actually a nice segue because I'm sure that all of you have encountered resistance to either initiatives or actually when you uh, use um, policies and procedures that you've implemented. So what kinds of resistance do you encounter and how do you manage that? Maybe you can hear from someone we didn't hear from on the last question. I think uh, one of the first kinds of resistance I saw, and, and one that I've actually, at one point, sort of felt in myself, is resistance to uh, new, unfamiliar, confusing language, especially terms that are used in a specific technical sense when you're doing safety, but have like common parlance words that other people use. Um, and one of those words actually is safe. Um, you know. Uh, a, in much of the world, safe means physically not going to damage me. Um, and when we're talking, when we're having this conversation, we need something else. And I think one of the best <coughs> ways to get around those types of resistance is to just simply do definitions, just do clear, understandable definitions, and sort of admit that in this context, what we mean is this. The way you used the word last week when you were talking to your mom, is also an okay way to use the word. We're not saying you're wrong because you used safe to mean not gonna electrocute me, but we're also not wrong to use safe to mean a psychologically safe and open space where I can play and not worry about stressors being added to me or even worse things. Um, so definitions and being open about the fact that sometimes there are multiple definitions. I've seen maybe people a lot more comfortable and they'll come along. Um, I mean, I, I, this is sort of weird, but I, I rely a lot on my privilege. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a, a white, cis, straight-passing man, and that means that other people in that category are more likely to listen to me. And so when I just say, look, we're going to have a code of conduct, we're going to do these things, this is how it's going to work. I'm like, but is it, like, yes, this is, this is how it's going to work. And here's why. And I'm trying to... You know, I have a lot of privilege, and, and so the point is, uh, I have the, that as a tool that I can use to make people listen and get on board, where they might not from from other people, which is problematic. But I mean, it's um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 we've definitely had people push back. Like, I've had people say, "Well, you know, why do we need to change this?" And I say, "Well, because we do," um, and then explain it and. and and so having having members with have, having members of every community with more privilege who are on board with the changes you're trying to make who are willing to tank for you uh, <laughs> makes a difference. And and that's in some areas or for some people can become the most important role model of behavior too. Is the person who looks and feels like them is doing it, so maybe it's okay for them to do it too. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there, I, put, we've, I've been really fortunate to work with um, some organizers who are just like, trust us, like, very and I implicitly, in terms of, and that's really nice, one of them is right there, uh, Event Horizon is a wonderful event, and um, they uh, trust us, um, so uh, probably too much. And then we, uh, when we recommend changes, um, um, which is wonderful, and it, it's thankfully worked out. Um, but then there's people um, who in the community 
um, who like, want to be a part of a community that's that's like safe um, <coughs> um, and has like these zero tolerance policies. But as soon as they're utilized, people get really upset, um, and that isn't. Um, the, it's it, as, as Brody eloquently said earlier, like a safety tool is uh, useless if it's not uh, utilized. Uh, and so, like, you have to, uh, uh, those people need to understand that these are real things we're implementing and not sort of like concepts to comfort um, because there is like an impact that we're trying to mitigate. Um, and then other forms of pushback, I've got it from um, other organizers who are seemingly very on board, um, who are very progressive and have implemented these things, uh, uh, you know, safety mechanics, and invented some, um, and are very, um, and are even, you know, well, uh, well known for that. Um, and um, I'll get pushback for them because they think they've got it. They've got it figured out. They have the answers. Um, and um, and there's been very clear instances where that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, Russell, I feel like you might have a good perspective on this. Uh, I mean, on a basic level, I think it's human nature to oppose change. So I think most of us just kind of, when you hear something new, it's like, well, it's always works, no matter what we're talking about. So I think it's important to have these conversations we've talked about with people. And I think people are much more likely to buy in when we're willing to speak with them about why we want it to be different. It's not just, this is what happens because this is politically correct or whatever else. This is what happens because there's reasons behind this. We need people to feel safe. And um, yeah, I think that's the, that's the big part of it. Uh, legally, I don't know that I can think of much for this that you get a big pushback on. I mean, if, I guess I'll go somewhere controversial. I feel so far we've all pretty much agreed with tools. I think everyone said it. Personally, from my setting of it legally, I think a very important thing, which I'm sure half people here disagree with me about, would be to not have alcohol at events. I think that really encourages a lot of dangerous behavior. And not that not that we can't, sure, we all feel like we can control ourselves, and most people can, but there's just, it really raises the stakes a lot. And just from a pure safety perspective, that's important. And then from a liability perspective, alcohol is the classic thing which can just ruin you as an organizer. Classic example is someone takes alcohol at your event, gets drunk, crashes into someone. This is a bit beyond this panel, but I mean, there's times in which you become actually liable for what happened. So if you knowingly gave this, if you saw someone was drunk and you gave them alcohol anyway, and they hit someone, you can get sued by the person's family who died they can ruin you, ruin your LARP, go after you personally. It, it can just ruin your life. And it seems like, no, or it doesn't make sense, or it's not fair. And there are limitations on it, but I would avoid alcohol from that perspective. But also just from the safety and consent, it's so much harder to tell when people are consenting to any sort of romantic or sexual or interaction with that. And as an organizer, I would personally not be involved in a game where there was alcohol as an organizer, just because from one, the serving it and just the liability, but also just that, I would feel so guilty and so hard to watch over and try to protect the players that I have a duty to help protect, and just gets into a lot of gray area I personally prefer to avoid. Finally, some unpopular opinions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Casey, can we hear from you on dealing with resistance from your player base? Yeah, we can talk about this all day. Um, so we've been having these conversations with our player base for probably, we're in our third year, I guess, of trying to really focus on it from the leadership level. And we've, we've encountered direct resistance, you know, pushback at a level of someone talking back in front of a lot of other people to try to big dog it to say, well, this isn't important. Uh, we've encountered the pushback from just fear, uncertainty, and doubt on the part of people who are having an experience that they personally enjoy and are worried that they will be unable to have that experience. And we've had to approach it with some compassion and some direct conversations to dig into what are you worried about changing? And is the thing that you're worried about changing actually actively hurting other people? We understand you want to be a good person and you don't want to hurt other people, so let's talk about how to solve this. But also being willing to say, if you're here to be a bully, this is not a good community for you to be in anymore, and we're willing to let you go. <laughs> uh, but 
having structured conversations and feedback around what people are, are concerned about and just drawing that out has been really useful. I think we need to do better at it, but just sitting down and going, we're committing to making this a safe environment. What does safe mean to you? What does safe mean for legal reasons? What does it mean for community reasons? How are we doing? What are your expectations and are they being met? Um, it puts people in a really vulnerable place because we plot them into this environment of a lot of history and cultural norms, and then we're asking them to talk about changing them or expressing dissatisfaction in a way that might not be popular. We fortunately don't deal with the alcohol issue, but there are other things that have been norms for you know longer than some of our players have been alive. Um, and that's that's a scary place to be. So if we're approaching it openly and having conversations to say, I hear your pushback, I want to understand where you're coming from let's address it or let's understand where our lines are drawn, that is a, a really good place to start and that's been very effective. Um, from my little bit of work in, in Boffer stuff, um, <clears throat> what I've experienced with trying to bring out new um, safety designs is that people will feel like it is cheating. And I think that the, the, where that comes from is that uh, they've had a system that they've operated within and they've invested uh, a fantastic version of themselves that they have put work into defending and promoting. Um, and the idea that someone might change that system is, is a threat. It feels like uh, they may lose power. They also, the things that may be addressed with the safety revisions, um, they could be addressing things that that person had to endure in order to get to that point of agency within the game and the community. So they may feel like other people must suffer through it because I had to as well. There's that, that we have encountered the pushback in the form of people choosing to push those boundaries and use the safety mechanics to try to gain personal advantage. And, and everyone else around them doing the right thing and applying their side of it to check in and make sure to back off and try to, try to help the community. And we have to be willing to draw the line and say, this behavior was good as per our design intent, this behavior was bad, and we're gonna tell you that directly to your face. Which is not something everyone in our community is good at communicating. So again, that's a point of vulnerability to say, I'm gonna to have to tell you this is no longer acceptable, how we wanna handle this. Um, what, for, oh, go ahead. Well, fortunately, we exist in an environment where we have trained everyone to construct a version of the world in their minds that they want to exist, and then all agree that it will be so. And that, <laughs> that, 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 um, that influence can be used in metagame ways as well, as long as you're conscious and careful about it. We will all agree that this is now so. Go forth and make it that way. Go ahead. One, one piece of pushback I've received was when I was talking to some of our organizers, I don't remember which game it was, where I was uh, ask them about their code of conduct. I was like, well, we don't really have one. And I was like, you, you really should. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, but if we have one now, won't people, you know, if we publish one now, won't people think that something has just happened that's caused us to react to it? I'm like, I, I don't <coughs> care. <laughs> <laughs> like, you have a community. You can make it clear that that hasn't happened. You should have had this from day one. The better, that, you know, the best thing you can do is have it from now. Uh, but that is a piece of feed, uh, pushback I've, see, I've seen a couple of times and I've seen directly, to me directly. If like, the, but like, won't people think something's happened if you, if you push a good conduct after the fact? But, but the argument could <laughs> yeah. argue also be things have been happening yeah. the entire you don't know. of the community and we don't know about them because right. there wasn't an yeah. Oh, I've, I've got one on that note. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I experienced a safety position shut down um, because the perception on the organizational level was that these problems didn't happen until there was a safety person. Oh. As though, oh. Oh. No. Uh, yeah, that happened to me. Um, yeah, that's a that's a legitimate thing. Um, so there's this uh, yeah there's um, there's a point of control on the organizational level where um, it seems as though these to to, to start gaining evidence um, of this is to start having to address it, um, and uh, that especially if there's the power to destroy that right in in a uh, a system that doesn't have uh, a clear hierarchy. Um, one that is also built around uh, the social reality and, and a, a network of social connections that contextualize gameplay instead of just being with people at a, a conference or at like a buffer community and other things like that. So um, that's something that, that's a form of pushback that I have seen as well. Well, my next question was going to be about myths that you encounter. Um, things that you've heard about whether it's safety mechanics that people think work that don't necessarily 
or perceptions about how your work should operate that are not effective. Um, so, you know, this common myth of, you know, if we, if we implement something, people will think something has happened. Uh, what, are, what are the misconceptions that you encounter? Kind of brought up. Um, <laughs> I didn't think about that. And I just, talking about codes of conduct, um, I've, I've experienced codes of conduct that are too broad, they're too absolute, and the things that they say will be protected within the community are things that organizers um, are perpetuating or maybe not aware of in themselves. Um, so there's this idea of, of nominal safety, and, and we talked about this earlier, if you put a safety mechanic in your game, it'll make your game safe. Like, no. Um, but there, there are people, there, there are ways of addressing safety and that you want it to be a, 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 a box that you can check off and be done with thinking about, so you don't have to say that your game is unsafe, and uh, that nominal safety, that exhaustive uh, authoritative safety, um, is that is not in dialogue with the players, um, or uh, or again, coming from the need to satisfy a category than actually address a problem. Um, that's kind of, that's itself a myth that like, if I say it's safe, then it will be safe. If I make the most complete code of conduct without analyzing like myself and what I'm perpetuating, then things will be fine. And instead just, uh, if anything, it can, it can come to quiet, um, quiet problems even further. Please. Uh, no, no, uh, sort of related to that, one, one thing that I've, I've seen is people who think that code of conduct should be absolute, should be should tie the hands of the organizers, should, should say, well, if you do this thing, this will be the punishment. And, I, and, uh, and that is fine for code of conduct for things which are not sort of traditional communities, I think. But if you're dealing with a community, I think it's actually, and, and this is, I just would have a, a, a mantra of like, do the work. Um, you. You need to treat each each incident as its own thing. You, you have to give yourself as an organizer the flexibility to look at the facts, look, look you know, look at the, who's hurt, uh, what's going on in that particular instance, and make a call and, and make it, and not have your hands tied by a policy that says, well, if this happens, we're going to do exactly this. Obviously, in the most extreme cases, you should probably have that. Um, but, but giving yourself the flexibility to do the thing which is right for those people, which uh, do the thing which is right for the people injured, building a better community, et cetera, and, and uh, so one of the myths, I guess, is that it is possible to build a, a decision tree that will always work, <laughs> uh, and it, it's not. You have to actually do the work. Um, I feel, there, there's a myth that I feel like, for me, I, I thought, maybe I, maybe I believed until pretty recently, um, to a certain extent, I, I, I just don't anymore, and it's that. Um, negotiation makes safe play, uh, makes play safe, um, and I think there's this idea that like you know if you can negotiate the shit out of your LARP, like it, there nothing bad could happen, right? <laughs> and, and on paper that kind of makes sense, right? Like if everything's if you get an assent to everything, then like there's you know, um, but in reality that cre it opens this really weird. You enter something that is maybe not even LARP anymore, and it really start, people start. The behavior is pretty strange um, in terms of um, the types of issues people start presenting um, about their their they feel this like the the unbearable weight of responsibility for all of those things, um, and then you have you enter this realm of. If something was negotiated improperly, does it count? Did I do something bad? If that, um, if, if if there's a strict formula to a consent negotiation, and it's day two of a multi-day game, and we're both tired, and one of us messes it up, but we do it anyways, then there's us thinking like, oh my god, did we just not? Did we? Did I do a bad? Um, and did I do a, a non-consent? Yeah. Um, and that um, makes trouble for, for everyone. It opens the store of, like, just do those mechanics even work? Um, and, um, and there's a lot of fallout as a result of people not knowing if what they did was consenting. Well, yeah, one thing that I've seen or read, I actually read an article about this, which I found very interesting on Nordic Art. I was not familiar with the term, but on broken stare. Just this type of person who, you know, we all know, oh, well, he's 
Sure, he chases women around, 18-year-old girls all the time, who he's three times older than, but he's a great role player. So, <laughs> and it can get a lot worse than that. And I think, perhaps, we sometimes think, organizers, whoever thinks, especially if this person's an unpaid volunteer who helps on staff, that nobody wants someone to get hurt or have someone be a predator to them. But I think we sometimes don't realize just how many consequences can come from that? On a, one end, of course, somebody's life can be severely impacted from predator, prey someone. I think we understand that. Everyone in the room probably agrees to that. The game can fall apart, which is much less important than that. Community, you can have other people who see that how you treat these people and they will just forever leave LARP as a result of that. And then even more to that, let's say you're a selfish person who doesn't really care that much about that, going to the legal side of it now. <laughs> You may think, I didn't want this person to sexually assault someone. But you know what? You can still be found liable if you have a volunteer who's acting in the course of their duty. Say, I think it's particularly probably bad in games where the storytellers have a lot of power, or you can get experience from them, or you can get special items or skills from them. If you have a storyteller that uses that to get sexual favors from 18 year old girls or maybe more underage girls, depending on where you are, you can be sued by that person's family and by the girl. And if it was seen by a court to be within the act of what they're doing, which is called vicarious liability, you can be you can have to pay damages. You, you the person who put on these consent mechanics, you the person who you know wrote the code of conduct, but you who made this exception for your friend or for someone because he's such a great role player. The court doesn't care about that. They really don't. And it's, um, there's an analogy, because obviously there's a lot of litigation on what is within the scope of employment. But my favorite one is, so just imagine you own a kitchen, and there's a chef in the kitchen. And he's juggling knives, he's juggling <laughs> knives in the kitchen. And you know, people come back, someone comes back to pay their respects to the chef and say, that was the greatest tuna tarts I've ever had in my life. And one of the knives, while well, he's you know, throwing the knives up, he slips, and one of them shoots and stabs the person in the chest, that's considered in the scope of employment. Even though you never would have wanted the person to be juggling knives in your kitchen, you never would have wanted any of that. It's kind of related, and just like a storyteller giving extra XP for sexual favors, that's in his, he's wearing the hat, or she's wearing the hat, or they're wearing the hat of your game. Therefore, you can be sued, you can be liable. Yeah, I, my dad used to tell me, well, were you doing something you weren't supposed to be doing and an accident happened? Yeah, then it wasn't an accident. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think our big myth is it'll never work. Yeah. It's impossible to do this in an existing community that, that the mechanics are based around several types of not obviously consensual trauma or interaction. Um, you know, it'll break everything. I think that is manifestly not true, but it does have to be handled with care. And you know, there may be some lines where we have to say, this is gonna drastically change everyone's experience when we cross this line. We are going to continue to push this. Uh, but if we just stop with, it'll never work, then nothing's gonna change. So we're seeing us being in a position of leadership within the rest of our community, even trying it. People are watching. Um, they'll watch us fall just as hard as they'll watch us succeed, but the fact that other people are paying attention to it means that there's a need for it that's not being expressed, and if someone acts upon it, then the next iteration will be better. Um, for myths, yeah, I was kind of, you probably saw me jotting them down as people were talking, thank you. Um, just um, from what you just said, uh, yeah, there's definitely a myth that it can't work. I think it's important to pay attention as the people implementing systems to not fall into the myth that it can like that we can solve everything and address everything mm -hmm. and that our organizations which may be very small and very amateur or much larger and professional that our organizations are prepared to handle everything people will come with trauma that you do not have staff members qualified to address and i think it's important to know when to say we feel for you and we will try to make you safe as possible in our space in our game and that's as much as we can do um, you know, our safety point of contact is not a psychiatrist. Our um, safety point, our, our grievance person is not an attorney. It's 
or they might be, but they're not your attorney. Right? <laughs> um, the, um, and, and sort of admitting limitations of what we're able to do is hard. It doesn't feel right when you say, nope, not our business, but it does sometimes have to be done. And that can free you from the, for us anyway, it could free us from the tyranny of perfectionism. Um, just to admit that it's an ongoing dialogue, and when it doesn't work, we're going to talk about how it didn't work and try to make it better the next time. Thanks. Is there something to yeah, add? I, I see so, some. So, well, one of the things, and I think it actually ties to this, is so one of the myths that is sort of a community myth is that if you have done something with the kind of conduct, you are a terrible person and must be, mm. you must be cast out. And this, I also do IT and, and security stuff, and, and take, take it into that realm. Like, you can't build a company that would, with a, uh, an emphasis on security and, and, and data protection if you're going to punish anyone for any mistake, uh, because then people won't come forward. People won't be willing to own mistakes. You need to be able, you need to, one of the, the I think most important things for building a safe community is, is having a culture where you can say, hey, that, the thing, that thing you did wasn't cool. Oh crap, you're right. I'll, you know, sorry, I'll learn from that and improve. And if the only, and if you've built a culture which is based around, hey, the thing you did was terrible and, and therefore you are terrible, and then the rest is going to be, you know, no, I didn't. Like, you can't, you know, you can't prove it. Like, you, you need to, to, you need to, in order to build a safe community, you need to allow people to, to mess up and then not that, and make that not be the end of the, their involvement with that community. Unless they messed up to a certain point, obviously. But you need to have that, that culture of everyone makes mistakes and we learn from them and move forward where that's appropriate and, and people aren't grievously injured. Um, so that people will self regulate, so that people will, will learn and improve. And so that people will feel comfortable making a complaint or pointing out an issue. Because if you think that if I make the smallest complaint about somebody, they're getting banished for life you will probably, many people will just let little things slide and let medium things slide. They won't even speak until they personally feel like banishment is the right answer because you've made it the only available tool. Uh, so you just end up not improving. There's part of that too, and also framing that like the, the consequences of a code of conduct violation are like for protecting the community. So if there's a, an instance in which like, someone uh, for the safety of play, like to investigate a code of conduct breach, like should be removed, uh, temporarily just separated from the play community while it's sorted out. Framing that as like, hey, this is what you would probably want if you were in this position. Like, this isn't about you, this is for us to figure things out. Um, framing it like that as opposed to like you're putting, being put in timeouts. Um, but I mean, it, it is, is a way to do it because like you may be wrong. You as an organizer may say, oh yeah, whoops, that, that wasn't a big deal. Hey, sorry about that. Um, and, or you may be right. So framing it as like, hey, this is what's going to happen. It's not about you. Like, this is what you would want. Uh, I think gets people on the same page with saying like, oh, I get it. Yeah, like I, I'll hang out in my room for an hour while you figure it out. Great. I'm so sorry. I hope, good luck. Come talk to me when you need to. So let me ask a follow up question. So I'm curious about to the people who run LARPs and deal with this a lot. Is I think you know I think we agree on the big points, but then you have you say we don't want to banish people for small things, but then we all agree you don't want broken stairs that we all. Agree with how do you deal with that? Is if it's someone you know or you've worked with a lot, of course we're going to look at it naturally. Oh, he's he's a great guy. She's a great woman. Never do that intentionally. So how do we weigh our own biases and then know whether to banish this person? H how do you do that? I think that's an incredibly <laughs> difficult thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that the values of the organizer are very very important because they should reflect the community's values, right? or should have that knowledge, that understanding. Um, and so like, what might be um, our red line in one community where it's like, you can't be here anymore, may not be the same for another, and that may not necessarily be bad, um, but like, for instance, like, um, I won't really be part of an organization, part of, I won't work with an organization that like, doesn't have a zero tolerance for hate speech, right? And that, that to me is like, if I hear that at a game, that person's fucking out. Um, and like, should stay out. Um, but, you know, if someone you know, messes up, to, it, there's a lot of things that you can mess up that probably just need to slap on the wrist and a talking to, right? Um, and I think um, 
the important thing there is for the organizer, the people being in charge of enforcing codes of conduct, et cetera, um, understand, um, well, follow through with what they say they're going to do, first and foremost, and second of all, um, have values that represent the employer base. Um, including the words repeated offense or repeated violation somewhere in the policy, I think was, is really, help, be really helpful so that you, you recognize that a bunch of little things can equal a big thing. Yeah, there's, a, there's some fine tuning that we are always continue to do around that. There are things that obviously are like, if I get any one of this and, it does, and we can't disprove it without uh, any other question, we have to eject you from this community. There's just nothing that can be done about it. But we need to encourage people to feel free to bring up the smaller issues, like everyone was mentioning, repeat offense, so that people understand our goal is not to find reasons to ban people from this community. Our goal is to teach people what was incorrect, give them an opportunity to, to address it. If that continues to not be demonstrated, then we have to have a bigger conversation about whether you're going to fit for this community. So also having a diverse safety team makes a huge difference people from different backgrounds. Different. So, you know, right, I'm, I'm talking from the convention space primarily, so people from, you know, we have, so one of the things I've been working on for next year's dinner time is, uh, with my head of safety is to identify 12 different communities that show up at Intercon and, and who from each of those communities is somebody that we would want to reach out for, to and ask if they want to be on our safety team so that no matter what community you're, you're part of, there's somebody that you know and, and can trust to bring things to, even if you don't know the core team. So. That, that helps get rid of the like without well, that that person the core organizer and you know and, and he's so he's tight with everyone. If you have a if you have a safety team that isn't automatically tight with everyone, that helps you avoid that. Oh, uh, one word that I want to emphasize, team, more than one person. I said something earlier about having a clear point of contact. More than one because sometimes that person is involved even if they don't realize they are. So uh, more than one backup. Excellent. Well, my last question actually is, what is a recent win that you've had? What's something that you, and anyone, just jump in, something that you're like, yes, we finally did this. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, we got paid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, different question. How do we do this work sustainably? Emotionally sustainably, financially sustainably, however you take that question. Can I answer your first question first? Yeah, please. Um, an organization I'm in that's operated by a board of directors, um, which is probably a lot like a, a LARP leadership team, uh, we recently had uh, two different individuals to deal with who had accusations of uh, sexual assault. Uh, one of which was an employee who was immediately put on uh, leave, and by the next and at the next meeting was let go, and was ushered out in was removed immediately and was ushered out of the organization entirely in as quickly as the organization is capable of moving. This was a case where there was there were witnesses. It was clear it wasn't. Uh, and, and it was handled well. The other one was where some, there was a rumor, and it was uh, somebody came to the board and said, well, somebody told me that their friend who used to live with so-and-so, that kind of a thing, and well, I can't tell you who told me, but I'll come back with a letter from them at the next meeting. And um, it, and eventually this person got actually, the accused person got into the position in the organization because it was determined through some hard work that that was actually the rare false accusation. Um, and so see one organization in the same three month period um, handle, handle two cases with opposite outcomes. No, this person, they're gone immediately, no question. This person, wow, that was shitty and they came out of it still as a a, a participant, um, that was a huge win to me that the group was able to do both things 
so similarly, this is back one question, I guess. Um, we had a, a, a set of reports from the last two intercons until the, they came in late, um, so we didn't know about them until this most recent one, about somebody who's making, some, making a number of people feel uncomfortable in a particular way. Um, and we um, ended up writing them a, a letter saying, hey, by the way, we've had a number of reports about this particular thing. Please be careful about this for this this topic. Um, and I basically sent it off to them and pretty immediately got a note back saying, oh my god, I have no idea. Um, I will be super on my best behavior. Please, if you think it's appropriate, pass on the, my apologies to the people involved. You know, thanks. You know, if, should I maybe not attend next year? And, you know, I want to make this right. Um, and we wrote them back and said, no, it's, it's cool. Like, you can, that wasn't like, if we didn't want you to attend, you would have said that. <laughs> um, and I think that this person has, has learned, and I think it was a, a night, you know, because we reached out in a way that wasn't blaming and it wasn't, um, you know, wasn't aggressive, we got, I think, I think we will end up seeing the, the behavioral change we want. Now, on the other side of that, we've also, Gone through long processes where, where, over many years, we've received reports about about the people and and, and I guess not. Sorry, we received reports about people about over a short period of time that covered a long period of time, mm -hmm. um, and we took did, uh, decisive steps and, and removed them from uh, from events. And that is uh, the network who actually went really well. So we've seen some of our community members start to interact with each other outside of just the staff demonstrating it, like on their own, and I think, I think that's a good win. Um, we've also, and personally I don't really care if they're internally motivated to do it, if they're just trying to impress us, but we've seen some of the people who were initially resistant starting to at least verbally and in some places in action support the behaviors that we want to see and I'm okay if they're just doing that to impress us as long as they keep doing it. <laughs> Their motivations do not matter at that point point. Um, and I think that if we can show people that folks who are initially way against it are starting to turn that leaf then it's going to build more momentum. So that will make it more sustainable and rewarding that behavior is something that we're more capable of doing because it's the majority now and not the minority. So it's, it's turning it into a, a cultural norm as opposed to something that is being imposed. I think the sustainability question is super important for this and just a thought I've had. I think there's a central conflict which I've seen with LARPs, particularly for-profit LARPs, and consent safety is that you have the incentive to just make your LARP as large as possible. You want to bring people in from the streets, you say, you know, LARP can change your life, we want you, but with that, with unknown people, people who are less, perhaps, knowledgeable about LARP, just come these issues and these questions that come up. And you say, say, how do we uphold our standards while growing the game, and growing the game of LARP more broadly? And I don't know that there are really easy answers. I think an important thing is talking about, like, we are here, trying to implement it in our games, these mechanics, taking the time to have safety discussions and demonstrations ahead of time, I think that's very important. But I just think it's also important for us to just realize that and look at ourselves and say, I want my game to get as big as possible because I make X amount of money per month per player that joins, and so of course you want more people. But you have to balance that with something sustainable, the amount of people you can actually, police might be the wrong word, but say police, and help that. And I just think it's a, it's a tough balance. Anyone else on the sustainability of doing this work? Documentation? Mm -hmm. Documentation! Like, write, write, down, <coughs> write, write down your, your policies and your procedures and the intent behind them, because um, you may not be the people doing the safety work for the organization forever. Hopefully you can pass it on to someone and, and make sure, not only do, you, do they have the actual words of the policies, uh, but also the intent behind them. Share and teach one another. It's um, and very nice code of conduct we wrote for um, LARP counselors. It is um, an essential part of the position um, that you um, stay uh, an active part of the community, proliferating and learn, uh, proliferating learned information and contributing to like the con ongoing conversation of LARP safety. Um, it's as important as doing the job, you know, being in the field doing the job. Um, I, I can't stress that enough. Even if you're not being a counselor, it's like that's 
you still need to be, um, it's requisite <laughs> that you continue to participate. Yeah, and on the, the flip side, unsustainable for our particular thing with LARP counseling is that if someone who has unscrutinized methods is continuing to act in a community, then they will continue to treat problems in, uh, in ways that may be based on something that isn't best practice, and then um, like those problems are going to build up. Like the, if there's a particular type of uh, helping that they're giving that is it actually helping, like it's going to happen consistently, and there's going to be no one to say, hey, we can make this better, this isn't good, if there's no scrutiny. Um, in there, and that also comes from having uh, again a team, people to uh, relieve each other, people to confide in each other. Um, like it is, uh, it is, it's much easier to get through. I mean, not even much easier. It's nearly impossible to get through that having a single person on safety. Um, you can go uh, so much further when you have someone who you can exchange work with and also vent to and draw energy from in doing that work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. Well, I think it's the perfect time to open up for questions. We had <laughs> okay, maybe a few minutes ago was the right time. <laughs> uh, my question was actually related to something that Brody just brought up, which was how do you care for your safety staff? Because there can be such an emotional burden from doing emotional labor, worrying about your community, trying to do the right thing and balance. And I know that I've had burnout issues on safety staff, so. What do you do about that? Yeah, you hire a couple of them. And, um, that's that's the biggest thing. I I can't I couldn't do it without another person there. It's just like being an emotional garbage disposal for four days is <laughs> brutal. And if you don't have someone with you, um, it's completely untenable. Second, when I say is feed them, um, because they. Um, <laughs> That's um, because it's, it's totally exhausting working, working safety. Um, so and it helps. It just it goes it goes a really long way. I've got a contentious and funny answer. And that you put it on them first. Like you ask them to scrutinize themselves. Are like are you ready to do this work? Like Fuck are, that. it's not like are you a helper? Static is that one of your identities? It's like at this point in your life, can you help people right now? Like should you not be here? Are you going to make things worse? Are you going to hurt yourself? Um, and have them like yeah, and get get them to scrutinize themselves if they want to be part of your safety team. Yeah, also, concise questions. Let's make that a trend. Uh, did we have one up, up front? Um, I I'm wondering if you have a standardized uh, series of steps when you address issues. Is it kind of we we have the right to do any of these things in any order that we feel like, or do you find that it's best to go through a certain amount of steps? And from a legal standpoint, is one better than the other? in terms of responses to, to bad actors? Uh, I would just say legally, the more formalized your process is, it's going to be the better. Just the more it looks like you're taking things in a systematic way. The worst thing is if it looks like they know this person did something wrong before and you're still keeping them there. That's the worst setup for yourself. I mean, we put a bunch of uh, consequences or actions in order from what we thought were the most mild to the most severe. Um, and preface it with a statement that these are all options and when possible we will try to do them you know in that order but that will not really always be possible and there will be cases where we have to jump ahead because of the severity and just you know it's just kind of saying it explicitly um, was helpful in more than one case we had an interesting problem where I think we maybe over formalized some processes to the theory that one of the bad actors attempted to use that not being followed in the way they expected against everyone. Um, so we're, it's still a learning process, but for us the most important thing is to communicate the intent, as, as has been stated here several times, to be transparent about what everyone can expect, but also to let everyone involved know that we're going to handle it without you know, damaging the reputation of the community. You know, everyone involved needs to feel safe that we're coming to them with an attempt to resolve the issue and, and close the book on it and not say, yeah, it's not a bad thing, everyone knows it, we're just, you know, leaving them in the community to fend for themselves. So everything's a little bit case by case, but giving people the right expectation and helping them understand our intent and putting that in writing is very important so that everybody knows that they're starting on the same page. Um, so I was wondering about transparency, about uh, not about the process, but about the, the results of it. Uh, there's a lot of obvious reasons why if someone like, you know, like if there's like some kind of like conflict between two people or something, you want to keep that like a secret from the community. 
uh, or like you don't want to reveal the details of that. Uh, but I've also run into issues where it's been like, hey, what happened to him? He was such a great guy, and then he just suddenly stopped coming. Oh, well, it's because he you know, did these horrible things. And it's like, then it's like, oh, but I'm still friends with him. And it's like, you didn't, because no one told you that this happened, because we're relying on word of mouth to find out you know, that these things are happening in communities. So I was wondering what's like the appropriate way to handle transparency, and what's like the, yeah, what's, what's that? So what we do with that for Neil is when we've taken a, a, an action, really, so specifically for, for bands, um, we have a ban list. Um, it is, uh, I like to call it public but not published. Um, any, so we don't say, oh, this person's been banned. But any member of the Neil community, which is to say anyone who's attended a Neil event in the last three years, which includes this one, can say, hey, Dave, who's on the Neil ban list? And I'm obligated to tell you. And that's a mixed approach that seems to work pretty well for us. There's only three people on it, so it's not. <laughs> this isn't super my area, because uh, uh, I try not to organize the very most I can. Um, <laughs> um, um, but I, 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 we do have recommendations, and, and I, without getting into the specifics of those, I would say that they are always about um, confidentiality first. It is my primary concern at all times when working in the field um, that. Um, that the people who need to be protected in those situations are, and if that means um, varying your degrees of transparency with the community about actions taken and who they were taken against, um, then you're then that's something um, to consider. Um, but big, always uh, big and first, right? I think there are probably legal concerns here in some situations. You know, slander is a thing. Um, that can be very impactful in certain situations. So we have had to vary our transparency response about why sometimes, um, and generally where we would fall is, we will let the community know that what action has been taken, but it is gonna be up to the parties involved to choose how much of that they want to share. Um, we'll make sure that it's known among our staff. If there is a genuine larger safety concern about something that could impact folks outside of the game, like abuse or harassment, we will do our best in each case to make sure that that is addressed or that people have the tools and information they need to carry it forward outside of the game community, but we, we need to not be involved once it kind of crosses our boundary. Um, it's super tricky. <laughs> and usually we're trying to make sure that whatever happens is communicated with enough transparency and kindness to the community to avoid a split or additional drama or whispers and rumors being spread that aren't true. Um, so I don't know if there is one right answer in that situation, but thinking about it proactively and again expressing our intent uh, is, is the first step that we have found to be most effective, which is to say this, this person has been asked to leave the community, the reasons are their own or our own. Um, talk to the people who were involved who want to know more, but that is their business. Now we're done. Yeah, and I'd agree just what you said. It's a totally right slander libel. We just have some concern over, I, I get we don't want to just know there's a sexual assault and that's why this person's gone, stay away from them. But as an organizer, you know, if sometimes we deal with a gray area where you, there weren't enough witnesses, or I mean, for us to like know legally that we're protected, they really did sexually assault, even if we all think they did. So you leave yourself open to getting sued. If there's any chance of gray area or something in your statement not being worded totally correctly, so. It's a difficult situation for that reason. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. Um, so, sorry, I wrote it down, so otherwise I'll forget. So I was super psyched that you guys touched on rehabilitative justice and that, but I know a lot of people who want zero tolerance of pretty much anything, um, whereas I know I need a whole lot to even begin to talk of an issue. So how as the community members do we negotiate that outside of codes of conduct? If you can't, if you feel like you can't bring it to that, how do you have those inter-community cultural conversations and how do you balance that with people's zero tolerance preference and that they may need zero tolerance preferences to be safe about anything. Uh, there are a lot of people I know who need result zero tolerance of anything. And how and where do we have those conversations? If, yeah, went for the hard part. Um, you, you consider your community, I think, and you put that forward and that, that's a decision that you make um, and a decision that players should know in coming in. Um, I think that, and uh, I think that has to do with material and class that gets the stranger with uh, buffer alerts often because it's harder to, there may be one in an area, but um, that's something that you make known that this is a place in which we have this as an option um, in order to, to pursue it. Restore it for 
but I, I try really hard not to attend events that don't have a published code of conduct, and that tells me whether or not I'm going to be, and, and specifically published code of conduct, which I think is a worthwhile one. <laughs> um, and, that, and that tells me whether or not I'm going to fit in with that community, and like, I, I, don't have, like, I don't have a need for zero tolerance policies, actually. I don't want to, super, I don't, I don't want to derail by getting into that, but um, I think we, as you pick your communities, uh, <coughs> making sure that you are in the community that, uh, that aligns with, with what you expect and what your needs are is key. And uh, we may do that is to only attend communities that are willing to be upfront about how they act. I have one more thing also. We, we considered a restorative model for this conference. Um, we figured out like we don't have training and we don't have consultation. We, those are other things that, again, if you implement a system that you can't enforce, you don't know how to enforce, then as good as you want it to be, you can't live up to it. So that's another part in instituting uh, a model like that um, is beyond consideration is being able to actualize the things that you want to bring to the community the values. One last thing about the, about the your player body is super super important. Um, I would consider um, a. Um, zero tolerance in some circumstances. For a long time, I um, ran a like trans-only small freeform group um, in my town, and um, um, it, there were there were a lot of disability in there as well. Um, it was a group of mostly neurodivergent trans people, like, um, and my need to protect them was very high. And so, like zero tolerance policies in that case makes sense. Um, they're like all at risk, right? Um, and so, but like, you know, maybe if I was in a thousand person buffer game, like that those, those same policies would not be in place. Um, I would love to hear from any organizers about how to address the uh, myth and fear of false accusations, uh, both um, like, I, I was, we heard a little bit on long term about how those things like get better over time when people <coughs> know how you act, but also uh, in the person to person, like when that fear comes up. Uh, one thing that helped with us to get a safer space policy accepted was, and to allay that for here, was to include the line, abuse of the safer space policy is also a violation of the safer space policy. Um, because a lot of, there are a fair number of people in the community who look at it and go, wow, look at all the consequences that could happen. What if somebody abuses this and you just need to project the statement, that's not what it's for and we're going to prevent that too. And like half those concerns start to fall away. I, I think it ties into the do the work. Um, it's just part of the reason why you need to treat each incident as, a, as, a, as its own thing. I mean, uh, not as a standalone thing, but, but you have to can't be bound by, well, if, if somebody reports this thing, we must immediately ban the person that they reported. So it's not a policy. Uh, that increases the, 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 you know, what about false reports concern. But if you, if you know, if your attendees know that if, if somebody comes to, to them with a report, that you're going to look into it and then make a determination, and that's the process you're going to follow every time, then false reports aren't as much of a thing because it's going to be caught. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that, or can we get one more question in? Uh, so my question is, uh, is, is really more for the like more established communities. Um, but as you're introducing these new mechanics, uh, do you have cases where your consent mechanics are abused? Yep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And, and I think I might have talked about it a little earlier, but we've had a couple of instances of everyone except the one person going out of their way to make sure that the safety mechanics are being applied, and then that person trying to use it as a tool for their own game. And some of it is setting, setting an example of making sure that that is directly addressed, and, and that we discuss our intent with them, and that we explain why that's not appropriate, and then following through with it. Everyone needs to understand that this is not about giving folks tools to make sure that they're the only ones not affected by the new safety policy. Um, but, but to say, like, we're involving you in being responsible for doing this, and that if it continues to not be applied, then you're not you're you're not demonstrating that you want our community to be safe. So it's not it's not meant to be pejorative or anything like that. Um, uh, but it's it's difficult, right? You're changing an existing cultural norm. Um, 
who, who wants to think about safety when you're out beating each other with phone lines? <laughs> but there's, there's loss and there's feelings and emotions and fear and you have to just have a conversation with people. Like you, I don't think we've ever had a situation where we didn't sit down, not even over email, but saying like, we're going to sit down and have a face-to-face -face conversation with you so you can look us in the eye. Everyone knows that they were heard. Everyone had a chance to express themselves. We may make a bad decision, but we're going to at least do our best to make sure that that opportunity was given and then everyone understands why we're going to move forward in the way that we're going to do it. I don't know if that was a satisfying answer, but... <laughs> it was a beautiful answer and a great note to end on. Um, we are at time, but I imagine that our folks will be available to answer your questions uh, after the panel. Why don't we just have a wonderful round of applause?